Amazing. God bless. Slay. All right. Incredible. Thank you. All right. It's 8.06. I think we go ahead and get started, perhaps. We have yep. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine folks in attendance. Super slay. I want to share my photo. Let's see if this works. Can you all see my little screen? Yep. Yes, ma'am. In incredible. So hi, everybody. No need to be on camera if you are uncomfortable with being on the camera. But hi, I'm Emily. It's really good to be in community with y'all talking about one of my favorite wine countries, wine regions, as it were. So today we're going to talk all about Austria. And if I kind of may go backwards to move forwards, I would really love to ask, is anyone drinking along with us? Do you have any Austrian wine in hand? Are you familiar with Austria? Are there goals that you want to take away from learning about Austria? If you want to pop into the chat, if you want to be vocal, I just kind of everything if everyone's so comfortable. You seem to be frozen and we can't hear you. Pop up into the chat to see if any. Oh no. Oh, okay, let's see. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Is that good? Yeah, no that's more good. freezing, I hope. All right, Bet, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I apologize for that. Um, what I was saying is that I always like to establish a bit of a baseline before I dive into teaching of where we're all coming from and all of our different frames of references. I think that as long as you establish a base words, yeah. Um, so is this anyone's first foray into Austrian wine? Do we have folks who have dabbled beforehand? Oh, we have WC3 Slay. Okay. Austrian besides Riesling. Yes, we're going to talk so much beyond Riesling. That's awesome. Okay, great. Oh, I love this. Love Gruner Vettlinger. Yes, we'll talk about her in detail. That sounds awesome. Fantastic. Okay, cute. Very cool. Thank you for that. I just always like to like establish a little bit of like where we're at. A little bit of context, I think, is super important. Um, so basically, just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, my name's Emily, as I said. Um, use she, they pronouns. I'm based out of the New York chapter. And my background is predominantly in natural wines of Eastern and Central Europe, with Austria being one of the regions that really spoke to my heart space the more and more I dove into it. Um, because when we're talking about Eastern and Central Europe, I think that so often it's plated as this like new wave of wine, when actually it's quite the opposite. These are some of the more ancient areas of winemaking that we're discussing it's like France who we can talk about her later on if we're talking about the real origins of wine we're looking east we're really focusing on places like Armenia Georgia even the Ukraine as it were and then seeing that move westward and then finding its kind of settlement into these regions that now we think of as being very classic but at the time, they were on the come up of the new wave. Um, so Austria is very interesting because it's going to be a landlocked country um, wherein it's bordered on the west side by Switzerland, Germany. To the south, we have Italy, Slovenia, Croatia. All the way to the east, we have Hungary, Slovakia. And up north, we have the Czech Republic. 
I like to think about Austria as this kind of lima bean shaped country. I like to put countries inside of clocks because it helps me kind of navigate it a little bit better where I can say, all right, 12 o'clock is here, two o'clock is here, six o'clock is here. So you'll kind of hear me utilizing that terminology as we start talking about wine regions. But I think that it's really important to first understand the country holistically and then to understand it broken down in terms of the wine regions themselves, the grapes themselves. So if we're talking about just the origins, 9 million people, Vienna is the capital. Uh, Vienna is one of the only real cities that exist that is also a wine producing region. So what's really beautiful about Vienna is in between the buildings, in between the skyscrapers, you see grapes growing and thriving. They're protected by the government. So you can't have conglomerates come in, and rip these vines up. So it's very romantic in a sense. It harkens to the days of yore. So to see that kind of modernity side by side with ancient um, grapes is really, really beautiful, I think, because um, it's very uncommon that you see cities actually producing wine and Vienna is producing wine. We'll talk about that later on. Um, the Western half of the country. So as I said, I'll utilize the clock uh, analogy. So if we're talking like nine o'clock to 12 o'clock, you're not really going to see a lot of wine produced there. We're really going to focus on the eastern side of the country where it's much less mountainous. You're going to see hills and valleys and some lowlands instead. Whereas on the western side, we're really talking about the Alps. It's difficult to um, produce wine there. That'll be kind of the barrier of access in that regard. Um, the east is where most people live. Uh, where most wine is made. And of the four wine regions, which are all located in the East, um, we also have to talk about um, the fact that this wasn't always the country as we now currently know it to be. So the thing about Austria that we have to think about is the historical context. So this is a country that was once part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which used to uh, encompass as far west as Austria and as far east as Romania. Um, and so what you have to think about when you're thinking about places like Austria is that you can't divorce the grapes from the geopolitical structures that have been in place. So this is a country that's been ravaged by two world wars. We had the communist regime at one point. We had that little bitty known as phylloxerif in the 1800s as well. So there's been um, these waves, as it were, that have dictated the wines in which we're familiar with, the wines in which we see. And there's actually a real prescribed reason as to why we don't know Austrian wines as well as we should, even though they have so much history because the Romans were the ones who brought the vines here in the first place thousands upon thousands of years ago. Um, things to note about Austria that I think are really important is that although it is basically a landlocked country, we're talking about lots of rivers, lots of lakes, lots of sea. So in cold regions, the vineyards are gonna need extra light and warmth. And you're gonna see that happen based upon the proximity to the water especially the main kind of player that we're gonna talk about is the Danube River. Uh, the light is gonna reflect off of that river and onto the best vineyard sites, which are gonna make those locations surprisingly hot during the day. So you have this beautiful kind of diurnal shift where the nights are very, very cold, but the days can be quite warm. And especially when you're talking about places like Wachau, you can see temperatures get all the way up into the 90s at certain points because you have that reflection of the um, sun on that river landscape. Um, it's going to release warmth that night that is gonna offset some of that cold continental climate. There is one lake in particular that I especially want to shout out, Lake Neuschwanzlesen, and that is going to be 
be much warmer than the surrounding area. It's a really mystical lake. It's only a few uh, feet deep, actually. And in some years, it's actually evaporated. So these are all mitigating factors that allow for um, a more kind of Mediterranean climate at times to um, be exposed and appreciated while still thinking of Austria as like that cold kind of area that we think of. Um, also speaking about the history of things is that there was a scandal back in the 80s, 90s, where in, okay, you know what, let me go back. It's, let me give context. So Austria, because it was part of the communist regime at a certain point, they really started focusing on bulk production of wine. So you started seeing all of the indigenous grapes, the heirloom varietals that they were known for at a certain point of time, those were going to be ripped out and replaced with international varietals. And those were going to be produced in bulk. Now, because of economics and capitalism decapitalizing, you saw that they moved and pivoted towards bulk production. And in doing so, they created their own kind of style that was associated with Austrian wines. Austrian wines have always been known as being really racy, really acidic, kind of enamel shredding in how acidic they can be, very lean, very austere. But in the 80s and 90s, a certain group of winemakers started actually adding um, diethylene glycol into the wines, which is a component of antifreeze. And when that was found out, uh, everyone was shook, right? And, and what's kind of funny and I, I won't say funny in a call sense but what's interesting is that Austria is not the only country who has done this uh Italy at one point or another also did the same kind of thing but Austria was really called out for it hard and you saw all of their sales plummet but because there is a uh, great capacity for repair great repair Austria is now one of the countries that is most committed to organic natural biodynamic production of wine and so they really took a hard pivot and now have some of the most strict rules and regulations to determine what can be made in Austria and what can be labeled as uh, table wine. Um, the traditions that are in Austria are very deep um, these are people who come from generations of winemaking, um, but because of the two world wars, because of phylloxera, because of communism, um, you saw that a lot of people were stripped of their essence of winemaking. They started just doing that more commercialized um, bulk production. And so there's this really exciting new wave in Austria that's happening right now where people are saying, I want to hearken back to the days of yore. I want to make the grapes in the style of wine that my grandparents were making. I want to honor my lineages. And so it's really exciting to see us go backwards to then move forwards. Um, a little context in terms of what we're working with in terms of language. The primary language in Austria is actually going to be Germanic. Um, some regions also speak Hungarian as well as Italian and some Slovak languages because you have to think about there's been mass migration of people throughout Austria to get west, right? You can't, the, the eastern countries can't get to the West without going through the likes of Hungary and Austria. So you see this real kind of cross-cultural exchange happening wherein um, it is Germanic, but at the same time, it's also very Hungarian and also very unique in and of itself. Um, when we talk about grapes of Austria, we, uh, I was super jazzed to see that some people were already popping off about Gruner, already popping off about Riesling. Uh, the main star of white wines in Austria is going to be Gruner Wettliner. Um, it is an indigenous grape to Austria. 
Uh, wines are made in a very similar style to Riesling in that it is going to be a moderately fruity. You get a lot of kind of peach undertones, but a lot of this kind of bright sugar snap pea, a little bit of asparagus. White pepper is a big call for Grunewald Linne um, and very high acid and very bold. Um, it's going to have more of a vegetal flavor. Think kind of like stewed lentils and uh, that, like I said, that white pepper is very prominent. Um, if Riesling is like super high tone acid, Gruner might be like a half step underneath that. Um, Riesling is always going to be high in acid with this really beautiful kind of citrus peach undertone. But Riesling actually only in Austria, the main star of the show is really going to be Gruner Vettlinen when it comes to the whites. Um, let's see. Um, if you're thinking about where to look for these grapes and know that they're going to be very um, kind of archetypal of the style. I would very much suggest Wachau or the Comptal for top producers of Riesling and Grunewald. Um, we can also talk about Vienna, but Vienna, um, as we get later on into this dialogue, will be well known for a different style of wine. So if you're looking for just like, I want to know what Austrian whites really um, showcase and, and really kind of are typified by, I would definitely suggest looking for wines from Comtal or Wachau. Um, so other indigenous grapes to be mindful of. We're going to talk about um, Weissbegunde. Weissbegunde is also known internationally as Pinot Blanc. Um, Weissbegunde in Germanic actually translates to white burgundy. Um, and back in the day, it was actually confused in Burgundy for Chardonnay. So you're going to see a lot of overlap within that in terms of the way it expresses itself, in terms of its um, preferences for terroir, for soil, and all of that kind of uh, nuance, if you will. Um, we're also going to talk about Neuberger. Neuberger is uh, a grape that expresses itself very fully. Um, it has a lot of personality behind it. You're not going to see a lot of solo varietal Neuberger. It's typically used more as a blending grape, but you're starting to see producers really want to showcase the indigenous varietals that exist. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see more Neuberger on the market as a solo varietal. Um, another grape to be mindful of is Gelber Muscatella. Um, Gelber Muscatella is yellow muscat. It's going to be um, Muscat um, It's going to make wines that are a little bit lighter in body, but really sharp fruit and a little bit spicy. To me, Gelber Muscatella always has this really beautiful kind of chai latte um nutmeg kind of aroma to it, a little bit of cinnamon spice. And like I said, that white pepper quality is something that kind of runs through the vein of a lot of wines from Austria. So don't be surprised if you see that pop up very often. Um, and we're also going to talk about the grapes Ziafondla and Rot, uh, Rotgifle. Um, they're very famous grapes from the Termin region um, in the history they were made into Botrytis wines because of the Habsburgs, who were the ruling family during the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They really loved this really sweet style of wine, of dessert wine, if you will. So Zierfondler and Rotgiffler kind of fit the bill there. But now as we've evolved and kind of fads have shifted and tastes have changed, you're starting to see them now as a very dry wine with a little less citrus fruit than Riesling and a little more of this kind of like charred honeycomb quality. Um, in terms of international varietals for white wines that you see in Austria, we're really gonna be talking, like I said, about Pinot Blanc, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, as well as Chardonnay. And there's also some plantings of Pinot Gris as well. Um, 
Something that Austria isn't as well known for, but they very much should be, are going to be their red wines. Um, red wine wasn't really their calling card for a long time. But when you're talking about Austrian reds, we would be very remiss not to mention Blau Frankisch. Um, Blau Frankisch is a top tier grape with very dark plum and berry fruit. It has a nice earthy undertone. It's really pure and transmits a lot of the mineral qualities of the vineyards, uh, mostly uh, coming to us from the Bergenland. Um, when we're talking about the soils here in Hungary, or excuse me, in Austria, you have a nice mix of schist and clay, but also limestone and volcanic soil as well so they're very um they add a lot of tension to the growth process which is really going to be expressed in the wines they're all very taut and very kind of austere but still have a lot of complexity to them um for me you get this subtle kind of mezcal smoke quality that runs through them as well um the other grape to know in terms of the red grapes of austria is um it's known internationally as Zweigelt. The reason I don't like to call it Zweigelt is that, and I prefer to call it Rotburger. Um, Rotburger is the same exact grape as Zweigelt, um, but Zweigelt is actually named after the doctor who uh, created it in the um, School of Oniology in Austria, but he had a lot of ties to the Nazi party. Um, he was a proud self-proclaimed Nazi and I don't think we should be giving him any more flowers than he's already taken. So I would like to reframe that grape in its ancestral name as Rotburger. But please know that if you see Zweigelt on a label, that is the same grape. Um, it kind of has this like red strawberry Twizzler thing going on. It's not very tannic, but it's very fruit forward, very red fruit forward. It's an easily ripening grape and can take on a range of weights and styles. It is the most common red grape throughout all of the regions of Austria. Um, thirdly to know is Saint Laurent. Uh, Saint Laurent is going to be a cross of, um, or sorry, uh, Rotburger is going to be a cross of Zweigelt and a different grape in Saint Laurent. Uh, Saint Laurent itself, I like to think of as like a very woodsy kind of Pinot Noir or even a Nebbiolo if you're familiar with a little bit more fruit. It has this smoked kind of strawberry quality to it, a little bit brambly, um, typically used as a minor blending grape as it were. But as I mentioned, we're starting to see it be done as a solo varietal as well, which is very exciting to see. Um, there's also a grape known as Blauer Wildsbacher. It's kind of a folksy grape. Um, you don't really see it used that much except for making a dark rosé known as Schulka. And it gives it this kind of like sour huckleberry pomegranate juice thing. Um, in terms of international red varietals that you'll find in Austria, we're talking Cab Franc, we're talking Pinot Noir, we're talking Cabernet Sauvignon, and we're also talking Merlot. Um, to bop over into the regions of Austria, um, we're first going to begin with a place called Nieder Österreich, which is known as Lower Austria. And what's confusing about this is that it's called Lower Austria, but it's actually going to be North. The reason why they call it Lower um, excuse me, Lower Austria is because it's at a low point of the Danube River. So a little bit confusing, but once you know that, you can kind of place yourself at like roughly 12 to one o'clock on that clock that we were kind of metaphorically using. Um, it's going to be in the lowlands of the mountains to the west. It's the largest wine producing region in Austria, producing more than half of Austria's wines. Um, it's almost exclusively white wines that are produced, although a pretty decent amount of red wine is made, although it's still going to be kind of in that 
bulk style of production, we are starting to see some producers really stand alone and make really beautiful, well-composed red wines from here, but they're still a little bit in the minority. A few from Lower Austria are going to be Gruner or Riesling, and they will be medium-bodied, dry white wines with a lot of kind of peachy fruit undertones. Um, some important sub-regions to note in Lower Austria are the Wachau. Um, the Wachau is Austria's most prestigious region, um, one of the top white wine regions in the world. And vineyards here cling to the slopes above the Danube, so they capture the sun's reflection and warmth, which allows for more um, ripening on the vine, which allows for the acidity to be in better balance to the sugar. Um, it has a really unique uh, quality system whereas it's done in three levels based on the ripeness levels of grapes. Once again, we'll still be making dry wines here, but we'll have Steinfette, we'll have Federspiel, and we'll have Schmaragd. Schmaragd being like the creme de la creme. If you're looking for Austrian wines and you see a wine from Wachau and it has Schmaragd on the label, that would be my go-to to pick up. Um, Schmaragd is really sweet. It actually references the fact that um, there are these green lizards that like suntan on the rocks. And when the sun hits their backs, it kind of uh, pops off this like emerald green color. So that's like the most prized uh, level. It's gonna be about 12 and a half percent alcohol plus. So we're not talking like big bombastic wines, but we are talking about really chiseled, well-made, highly acidic, very crisp, very clean whites. Um, also within Lower Austria is going to be the Comptal. Um, it's a very similar style to Wachau, a little bit more price conscious, I would say. And instead of coming from the riverbanks, the best wines from Comptal are going to be from the steep, steep vineyards that are really hot, that are on primary rock. Um, if you're looking for super bang for your buck, I would say check out the creme stall. It's going to be basically more affordable versions of the Wachau and Comptal. Um, if you continue going on, you also have Trizental and Wagram. They're gonna be larger and a bit warmer north and south of the Danube. So you'll have fuller expressions of Gruner some reds, and there's this grape also known as Rotervetliner that is well known in the Wagram, but you're not going to see these as popular on the, um, the exported market. You'll see these wines really be kind of kept closer to the vest on the domestic market. We don't really see them being exported that much in this current uh, economy, as it were. Um, one region that I would be remiss to mention would be Weinvantel. It is a large expense covering the northeast of the country. And there are some warm pockets of Weinvantel, but for the most part, it's pretty cool. Um, it's really affordable in terms of land. So if you're looking for like the come up area, I would say check out Weinvantel, especially for like the natural wine scene. You're starting to see a lot of young folks plant down or no pun intended but like put down roots there um, because it is a lot more affordable than the likes of Wachau and uh, Comtal as it were. We also are going to talk about um, as I mentioned Vienna. Uh, Vienna is like I said one of the only cities where vines are grown on a commercial scale and the wine that I really want to point out for Vienna is going to be a style of wine known as Gemitztersatz. Gemitztersatz is basically a field blend because when you go into Vienna, they don't really take the time to differentiate white grapes versus red grapes. They're really kind of co-planted all together. So think about just like shopping cart style, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this here, um, all co-fermented together. Um, for Gemitztersatz, about 50% of it has to be um, indigenous grape. 
Um, so you could have a good mixture of sets that's predominantly Grunevet Linna, blended with the likes of Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, you could have 12 different grapes thrown into this cuvee and it could still be called a Gemitster Satz. Um, one of my favorite Gemitster Satz actually comes from a producer known as um, Ambrosich. And it's like a rosé because she puts, uh, she's a fabulous femme winemaker who was a graphic designer turned winemaker. And um, she puts Saint Laurent and, um, excuse me, Blau Frankish into her field blend so it looks like this really dark dark rosé if you ever find it on the market i would definitely tell you to pick up a bottle because it's just really really delightful but they all have this kind of crunchy acidity um we're going to see a lot of this herbaceous kind of like aloe water quality to it as well um really really delightful um they're very crisp but they're very clean and very very traditional but we're starting to see them done with a more modern kind of sense. Um, producers to look out for that I would highlight for you guys are Christian Sheeta, um, Gut Agal, Klaus Pressinger. Um, there's a producer known as Heinrich, who is one of my absolute favorites. He does like a skin contact a muscat done in concrete. That's really, really delightful. Um, but very, very clean, very crisp, aromatic wines are going to be coming to us from these areas. Um, most south, we're going to find Styria. And Styria is going to be interesting because Styria is very volcanic in its expression of things. Um, you see a lot of biodynamic producers finding their way to Styria. Um, you find Chardonnay here, but it won't be called Chardonnay. It'll be called Morillon or Morillon, um, which is the local name for Chardonnay. And these aren't, you know, like Robert Parker, California Napa Chardonnays. They're going to be much more crisp, clean, austere, much more the likes of Chablis. So if you don't want to ball out on Chablis, we're being a little bit more budget focused. Look for Austria, look for Styria. It is a fantastic wine region for the value and for the expression. Um, I would say the, um, the producers to look out for in Styria. My absolute favorite is Shepe. Uh, they're a biodynamic producer who produce um, pre uh, predominantly white wines uh, and they all have labels uh, depicting different garden bugs. So you'll have like their salamander bottling, their stag beetle bottling, um, very, very modern interpretations. Um, we also have Sepp Muster, a husband wife team that do really delightful kind of old school versions of Austria with a slightly new wave take, a little bit more pop punk. Um, but the thing to know about all of these producers is that given that pivot in the 80s and 90s away from the commercialized bulk production, most of these producers will be organic. Most of these producers will even be biodynamic, whether they're certified or not, they'll still follow those principles. So it's a very exciting region to focus on when you're talking about the future of natural wine and natural wine without necessarily being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I, I think that we've kind of pivoted so far in the natural wine movement where it's like, oh, this has so much sediment in it and it tastes like kombucha and it's a little fucked up and that's natural wine. That's not in Austria for the most part. They're gonna be very crisp, clean, well dialed in, complex, well-made sophisticated bottlings that also just happen to be incredibly naturally produced um i feel bad because i'm not the techiest of persons and so my like uh slideshow that i had planned wasn't working out so i only have this map to show you guys so i do apologize but if you all put your or would be kind enough to put your emails in the chat. I am more than happy to send you all of my notes on this. I know I've just been kind of going off the cuff without uh, being able to kind of um, 
you know, like the bouncing ball of back in the day when you would like sing along to songs. Um, I wasn't able to provide that for you and I greatly apologize. So if you want to put your emails into the chat, I would be more than happy to send you all of my notes as well as send you um, reference points as well. Um, oh, Slay, thanks y'all. Okay, cute, very cute. I will make sure to do that, absolutely. And thanks for bearing with me. Um, I get so nervous. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to myself in this like massive Zoom. Um, great, okay, dope. I'll make sure to send that along for y'all. Um, in this moment of kind of pause, does anyone have any questions or anything that's popped up for them that they're curious about? I'm curious, when you talk to Austrians, um, do they drink a particular wine than what is like, in, uh, sorry, exported out of the country? Like for instance, is it regional? Is it, or are they just um, kind of connoisseurs and like to drink all different kinds of wine? Yeah, that's a super great question. Thank you for asking. A lot of it, like what we have to think about is that a lot of these people are just farmers. Right. They don't really consider themselves winemakers. They consider themselves sheep herders. Right. Who just happen to make wine, let's say. So it's a little bit of this kind of like um, I don't want to say flippancy because I don't want to discredit what they're doing in any way, shape or form. But it's just so the water in which they swim in that it's all around them. Right. Um, so I would say most of them are going to be drinking um, the things that grow within relative to their dinner. Um, they might be drinking Sauvignon Blanc, sure, but more often than not, we're focusing on the indigenous varietals. And that's really where their passion, I think, lies. The, the more I've spoken to Austrian winemakers, the less they're leaning on the likes of Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, and the more they're leaning on the likes of Grunewald, Linne, um, Weissbegunde, and things like Rotgiffler and Zierfondler. And I really think that's kind of the movement we're moving towards is that reclamation of indigenous varietals rather than leaning on kind of the necessary crutch that international varietals were like they they did play a very important role but i do see them starting to pivot away from that and really refocus and reframe a commitment to the grapes that were naturally found there for so long um because what we have to think about is that if it's a timeline of Austria in a very short amount of time, they got wrecked a couple of ways, right? They had First World War, they had Second World War, they had phylloxera, then they had the communist regime. So there was a lot of ripping up of vines that occurred to then have them transplanted with these international varietals. And now they're really doing the work to pivot backwards to move forwards, if that makes sense. So I think um, one of my favorite things um, that uh, a winemaker said to me, uh, this guy came up to him and I'll be honest, it was at a wine fair and the guy had definitely indulged a bit in the wines and he was like, I'm eating a chicken sandwich. What do I drink with this? And the guy was like, Muscat. Duh. Like, it was just no no question about it. You drink what's next to you, right? Um, so I think with that, you'll you'll lean more on the Gruners and more so on the um, indigenous varietals, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'll ask another and question. Oh. <laughs> yeah, please. Are there um, producers that you, I know you mentioned some regions that we should look for. 
So are there some like particular, I don't know, your top three producers that you know, if we see them in a wine store, you're like you must get? I'm going to pop them into the chat right now. Um, if you have, if you get a bonus from work, this is the producer to get. They're expensive, but this is my favorite producer. Oh, no, I did that as a direct message to Kelly. Let me put it into everyone, meaning group chat. Um, Shepe is like archetypal Austria, and their wines are absolutely stunning. Um, so I would say Shepe would be one of the absolute people you shouldn't miss if you're able to get your hands on a bottle. Um, one of my absolute favorites and very, very pristine expression of Austria. Um, another one would be that's a little bit off the beaten path a little bit, dare I say a little funky, um, would be Strohmeyer. I'm going to go throw that into the chat. Um and let's see, if you're looking for very classic, I would say Knoll. Um, I don't want to say that they're boring because I would never, but they're so, do you know when something's done so well that you just kind of are like, eh, <laughs> does that make sense? I don't know. Um, those wines are really, really beautiful and really well manufactured, but they're not as, um, jazzy and and kind of high tone as let's say a chefe uh another one to know is Tanat. they make a beautiful chardonnay they call it morillon um that is a fantastic producer um a very culty producer that you'll see very often is gut agao uh they made like a family of wines so um if you ever see they have these illustrations on the bottle of faces and every face is a different like member of the family. Um, so it's like Winifred is like the cheeky, cute, young femme. Uh, Sicily is their like new kind of uh, uh, like non-binary take on a person um, and is a field blend and is their answer to kind of the Mr. Sats. Um, so that's kind of a fun one. They are a little pricey. We are starting to see Austrian wines get a little bit more expensive than they were back in the day, which has me feeling a couple of different types of way. Part of me is like, yes, they deserve it. My wallet is like, please don't. <laughs> um, but I would say that those are some of the top ones to keep your eyes out for. I had a question. Please. You're doing a great job, by the way. Um, and oh, I, thank you. I'm like super nervous. I appreciate <laughs> that. No, you're welcome. And I might have missed this, but I had to step away for a little bit. Um, yeah. Did Austria, did the wine production in Austria suffer at all because of any of the world wars, such as like Champagne was affected by World War II, was like Austria affected by like World War One, and any of those sorts of things? One thousand percent. And what's so basically like the Austro-Hungarian empire is something that if you want the hot goss on Europe, study the Austro-Hungarian empire because it is like the real housewives of Europe. I mean, there is so much, I, I hate to call it gossip, but at this point there is so much gossip from that era of just stuff going on on because you had so many instances of Austria being this big to them being this big to them being this big to them being that big to them going back to being this small um just because of all of the um passing on and all of the the conquering the losses the wars um it it's a place that I I think that when we think of Central and Eastern Europe we would be absolutely remiss to not divorce it from the fact that these are places that have experienced wars upon wars upon wars and systems of oppression, much as, I mean, this is unfortunately the world in which we live in currently, um, but grapes aren't immune from that, right? Wine isn't immune from that. So because of that, Austria really, really saw a um, a decline in wine making 
um, because of the fact that they were just ravaged by wars. And then phylloxera came along. They lost many of their plantings. Um, when the communist regime was in power, um, I mean, Austria, I don't want to say was lucky because I don't want to discount all the like atrocities that occurred, but Austria is pretty lucky in that they got accepted into the European Union pretty early on. Uh, if you look to their neighbor, Hungary, Hungary was not so lucky in terms of being accepted into the EU early on. So there was a little subtle level of protection that Austria had because it was adopted into the West very quickly all things considered. So that allowed for a lot of rebuilding to happen at a much more expedited rate than let's say it's neighbor Hungary who is still kind of dealing with the uh, ramifications of that. Um, so you saw a lot of the indigenous varietals lost. You saw a lot of winemakers stop making wine. Um, and you also have to consider the fact that when the, the communist regime was in power, they didn't really designate Austria as a winemaking country. It was used for other things, much like Hungary, for instance, was uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not going to think of it, so I'll just use something else. Um, Austria was labeled, or Hungary was labeled a wheat country, right? So they just produced wheat for the armies. So they lost much of their wine production because they had to pivot to producing grain. Uh, Austria is somewhat of a similar bag. They weren't really noted for their wines, so that went, their production went down. Now we're starting to see much more wine being exported from Austria, which is really exciting to see it on the international market. But it definitely, definitely was affected by both World War One, World War Two, and I would say phylloxera as well were kind of the three big things that rocked it to its core beyond that scandal in the 80s and 90s, which really kind of halted a lot of their production. They really had to like climb and climb and survive by like the skin of their teeth to be trusted again. Um, which is sad because similar things happened in Italy and no one thought anything of it, right? But for whatever reason, that scandal rocked Austria and people were like, hands up, drop your knives. We're not fucking with Austrian wine anymore. Um, excuse my language. Um, and so to see it become a major player on the international market shows just how much that they have grown. Thank you. I have follow up questions. But yeah. I'm gonna stop because I can, I can talk about wine and history like forever. So I'm not going to. Oh, it's my favorite. That. But, but uh, thank you for answering the question. Yeah, of course. Happily. And, you know, we have a couple more minutes if anyone has any questions. Oh, I thought of another producer I really love. I'm going to put it in the chat. They're great. Shodel is fantastic. Mm -hmm. How are we I'm gonna go ahead and ask. I'm gonna go ahead and ask yeah. my question then. So, besides the scandal that happened in the '80s and '90s, um, which perhaps is more of a like a conversational, ongoing question, uh, what do you think that what hampered Austria from being able to bounce bounce into the worldwide market as opposed to like a place like Champagne that was ravaged by war and all of these issues and pretty much taken over by Germany? was able to bounce back more quickly 
and become this world-renowned region, whereas Austria took quite a bit longer to become a successful region, at least on the worldwide market, in comparison with having the same issues. I love this question. I'm going to answer it more so as Emily than anything else. I think the reason why was probably having to do with the Soviet regime. Um, in that Austria was in this weird tug of war for quite some time where it was not necessarily a Western country. It wasn't necessarily an Eastern country. It kind of existed in this like state of purgatory as it were whereas france has always been very west right um france also has a lot more um uh access to waterways right um whereas because austria is so landlocked there's not really the ability to throw something on a boat and get it out of there um you really only have lakes and rivers and the Danube is really the only major river that I, well, no, sorry, I'll take that back. There are tons of rivers in Austria, but the Danube is really the only major access point that I could think of. Um, so I want to say that it was probably that kind of um, tumult that it went through where it was kind of being um, in a state of tug of war between the west and the east that, that didn't allow for it to fully kind of have its solid identity which i think allowed for a lot of misunderstanding to just be kept domestic i don't think that they had really the ability to export and you know, there are other things that come into play that you have to consider, whereas in like, to get into the EU, you have to have certain stipulations that you follow. And Austria was really lucky. They kind of, a stipulation of them entering into the EU was that they could only produce like 80% of the wines that they're able to produce so if they could produce you know oh god i'm so bad at math if they could produce 100 tons of wine the eu was like you can only make 80 um austria didn't have as hard of a time with those stipulations but they were still made so i think a lot of these factors are geopolitical and we can't divorce that from the wines um, and I think that would be my answer to that question. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Does anyone else have any questions? Was this helpful, I hope? <laughs> I hope we learned one cool thing. Yes, it was helpful. Thank you. Yay! Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. And if you have any questions, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, if ever you want to talk about any um, uh, Eastern European regions, like I said, that's my background. Um, so always happy to, to make myself available for that. Um, so I'll throw my email in. Let me just make sure I'm spelling it right. That's embarrassing, but that would also be embarrassing if I didn't do it right. 
there's no period there, Emily. Okay, let's do that. Oh, oh yay, y'all are so Thank sweet. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Yay, thanks, y'all. Thanks for spending your night with me. If you want to um send me the the slides in the notes and I can send it out with the with the recording to the community so that everybody has access to it, then that that'd be great. Fantastic. I will definitely do so. What's your IG, Miss Emily? Oh, okay. I have one that's inappropriate that I'll put and then I'll put my professional one. The reductive reasoning is my attempt to start my Eastern European wine school. So stay tuned for more information content on that one. If you just wanna see what I'm doing in my life, it's the other one. <laughs> But I really appreciate y'all taking the time and taking time of your lives to be in community with me and hold space with me for one of my favorite things to talk about. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you all for um, coming out and participating and the questions. And hopefully, like I said, hopefully you all uh, learn something new and she will be hosting another study hall, I think, is it June? I think June, I think. yeah. Yeah, yes. So she will be back. And also, if there's anything that you all would like to talk about, if you have any wine knowledge or even spirits knowledge, please let me know. And we can, um, we always like having our members share their their knowledge with the community so if there's something that you want to talk about um, please let me know and we can get you on this on the calendar so, outside of that if you all don't have any more questions everyone have a great night thank you bye thank you bye-bye